Thank you, Kangsan, for the introduction, and thank you to Nada and Salwa for inviting me. Uh, it's been stimulating so far, and I hope this panel is also. Uh, I deliver this with two caveats. One to say I don't have a PowerPoint, so you can look at me, or you can study my name and learn how to spell it, which would <laughs> please me very much. Uh, and secondly, just due to this little being, I get a little out of breath, so I may have to take a few pauses, so please be patient as I <laughs> pause to get my breath. Um, so, let's begin. Why does everybody introduce the artist like that? Like what, I asked. Like this is the artist, they are from here, and now they live there, their parents are from over there. What has it got to do with the work? I was stumped by these questions posed to me by a budding young collector to whom I was giving a tour of the Middle Eastern galleries at Art Dubai. My job was to introduce potential new clients, most of whom were the guests of the corporate sponsors, to the galleries. I would give a two-minute introduction to the gallery and the artists on show based on information I'd learned from them during training the day before. For many of the guests on my tour, this was their first time at an art fair and my job was to provide a gentle introduction. This question called out a formula, a way of speaking about artists and their work that is integral to their presentation at art fairs, something I've studied in many settings, particularly here in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. What does this way of talking about artists in terms of their national origins or geographic affiliations do? On one hand, it may point to cultural affiliations that might make their presence felt through an aesthetic or technique or even content of the artwork on display. On the other hand, this type of introduction has become customary in an art world we label global, where itinerant artists, curators and collectors meet in a number of cities and events during any calendar year. Sometimes, perhaps what keeps a person rooted is a sort of origin story that provides cultural underpinnings and national affiliations. What I'm focused on today, however, are the hidden processes of the art world that undergird this global circulation we've been discussing. Artworks, artists, and all of the different actors of the art world move in the same structures that keep other kinds of goods on the move, embedded in politics, financial structures, and material infrastructures. Today, I'm focused particularly on art and artists from Iran, but what I speak to is relevant to the globalization of art in general, as I demonstrate this is not an even or smooth process. What I hope to show is how the national labels that we may use to describe an artist have many other designations which impact the ways in which artists and their work move in the world in many often surprising ways. On July 14th, 2015, China, France, Germany, Russia, and the United Kingdom, and the United States, known as the P5 plus one, the European Union, and Iran, reached an agreement over Iran's nuclear program, a bone of international contention for decades. Given the catchy title of Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the JCPOA, the accord ensured that Iran's nuclear program was exclusively peaceful. A key term of the deal was that sanctions could be snapped back or reinstated immediately if Iran failed to comply with any of the terms of the deal. As of just last week, Donald Trump reinstated American sanctions against Iran at the dismay of his European counterparts and despite any evidence that Iran has compromised on its side of the deal. Over the past decades, sanctions have blocked the import of materials that could be used in the enrichment of uranium, frozen the assets of anyone involved in such activities, prevented any non-humanitarian aid, and required UN member states to inspect cargo arriving from Iran in case they might contain prohibited substances. The most impactful of the sanctions have been those that were designed to keep Iran isolated from the global economy. First employed by the US, joined by the EU in 2012, this involved the blacklisting of all Iranian banks and the extension of this, of this also to non-US, secondary non-US based companies which means essentially that if organizations were found to be working with sanctioned Iranian institutions, they would be prevented from doing business in the US or fined heavily for such activity. So it essentially means you have a choice. You do business with the US or you do business with the Ir Iran. So you can imagine what most organizations chose. Like any legislation of this kind, most ordinary citizens are not familiar with the fine details. But what, ev what everyone knows is that Iran's central bank banking system has been cut off from the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, what we know as SWIFT, which means Iranian banks cannot receive any payments in US dollars. 
I outline the details of the sanctions and their effect on the Iranian economy and relationship with global markets because they fundamentally impact the way artworks themselves can circulate. Although artworks, like other cultural material, such as films, are protected from direct sanctions, their exceptionalism as cultural products does not protect them from the rules which govern the transit of Iranian products more generally. When artworks are on the move, they're wrapped up, packaged and contained. In the spaces of transit, on airplanes, in custom houses, their primary status is not as an artwork, but as cargo. Like the artist that made it, the cargo originates from Iran. So to better understand the journey of an Iranian artwork, I made a trip to the customs house at Dubai airport while conducting field work in 2016. I accompanied Ziad, whom I was connected to by a gallery based in Al Sarkal. He was described to me as an agent, an employee of a third party company that assists the gallery with collecting artwork from the Dubai customs house. His primary job was to collect the artworks that have arrived at the airport and transport them back to the gallery. Seemingly simple job. After sending messages via WhatsApp for two days to make arrangement, Z arrangements, Ziad greets me at the door to a stout, nondescript building that houses a number of different offices, each separate entities that all work on interrelated parts of the customs process. We are to collect two shipments, two crates arriving from Iran. As you can imagine, the process requires a huge amount of paperwork to be filed, of which Ziad is an expert. He begins by making a photocopy of his ID at the entrance to a large office and waiting room. We retrieve a number from the pulley, wait in line to collect the correct shipment documents from the Emirates Sky cargo team, who are in charge of all the cargo. The room is organized like a bank, with a line of tellers on one side and people waiting patiently on the other. But also like a bank, it's hard to decipher who is doing exactly what and how long each customer's transaction might take. So obviously we're waiting a while. Uh, while we wait, Ziad explains to me the information that each form requires. Once we collect the shipment documents from the cargo team, we retrieve another paper number and wait in a new line. This is to pay the airlines a fixed charge for handling the cargo in their warehouse. Once this is paid, we go up to the third floor where we visit the office of the Minister Information who must approve the content of the artwork before allowing it to enter. It's here that I learn that it's up to the person collecting the item to warn the sensor if there are any potential issues with the shipment. Ziad makes another call to the gallery and ensures that the artwork present no issues. He also explains to me that the shipments, shipments from places like Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan are frequently open. In that case, it's very important to make clear any issues in advance, rather than get caught out when the crates are finally open. So after visiting the office of the Minister of Information, we climb the stairs one floor, enter a new office where all the details of the shipment are inputted into a central system. This takes quite a while again. Ziad chats with everyone in this office and we hang out there for a while, waiting to hear that the censor uh, uh, has, approved, has approved the shipment. Once it has been approved, we're supposed to head to a loading bay for the crates to finally be opened in all of our presence, checked a final time before they're released to us and taken to the gallery. Before this, the import tax must be paid, so we write a check, Ziad writes to a check to himself that he then cashes the bank on the ground floor. So we're up and down, up and down, up and down in this building. He now has enough access to pay for the import of the shipment. It's a Thursday and approaching lunchtime. If the shipment is not approved by the censor soon, it's likely we'll have to wait until after the weekend to collect it. By 1 p.m., there is no news of the shipment, so Ziad decides it's time to call it a day. For the next few days, we continue to send WhatsApp messages in order to coordinate a meeting for the release. But as he has to move quickly, once he gets that news, he returns to the custom house without me on the Sunday, as he predicted, the first day of the new working week, and the shipment is released. Iranian art, like an infinite number of other items, travels across well-worn routes over the Gulf but may incite suspicion on arrival, simply because of the origin. Shipping crates that arrive from Iran to many international destinations are still habitually checked on the suspicion that they may have things other than artworks inside of them. This often meant that shipments are kept in customs for longer, sometimes impacting the installation of openings of shows. And obviously today I'm talking mainly about the sanctions and the objects themselves, but we can also have a very long conversation about visas and that issue. I've also seen many times where the artworks have arrived, but the artists and the gallerists and other people haven't arrived. So it, it goes both ways to say. Uh, 
So although the terms of the sanctions did not apply to cultural material, as I mentioned, which means the artwork should be able to travel without issue from Iran to the rest of the world for exhibition or private sale, not every employee in every customs house globally is fully versed in these laws. Indeed, artworks are unable to circulate outside of mechanisms which seek to curtail the circulation of goods, money, and particularly crude oil into and out of Iran, and are held down by devices that create borders between Iran and the rest of the world economy. These artworks are embedded in a politics writ large, including the foreign policies of nations and supranational entities like the United Nations. The reach of each of these is itself hierarchical, the, inter the international organization possibly trumping international politics where differing scales of power between nations and their own potency in the international arena is enacted. In the same sense how I explained at the beginning, it's up to companies to decide, do they transact with Iran, do they transact with, Iran, with the US, the same as nations. So there's almost like a hierarchy embedded in that. Art objects may find themselves in liminal spaces or what anthropologist Christopher Steiner describes as a semi-autonomous social field between academic and art world discourse and legal frameworks. The reminder here is that while increasing global connectivity allows artworks to traverse borders, the borders themselves are not erased. In the activity at the Customs House in Dubai, a similar reckoning between different mechanisms to control Iranian commodities, between hierarchies of national and international power, and the difference between artworks and other kinds of objects plays out. It's left to Ziad to speak on behalf of the artworks, negotiating with the censor, reporting on an artwork's content as instructed by the gallery. His work is to navigate the whole system smoothly and to advocate on behalf of the shipment, the artworks inside of it, and the gallery who needs to exhibit them. In this case, Ziad, the employee of the Ministry of Information, the artist and the gallery do not need to agree on the art, the art object's value or what it really is, is it indeed art, but they do need to agree, well, they do need to agree that it is indeed art and not some other kind of commodity or object in order to be allowed through. Ziad himself is an expert in this process, so we also have at play a different kind of expertise, not necessarily an art historical knowledge. The circulation of artworks across national borders connects broad networks of dealers, collectors, curators, artists, and audience, audiences. It links urban centers through the appreciation, consumption, and institutions of the art world across space and time. Sanctions may disrupt this through the limiting of materials artists can obtain, the channels through which their work can travel, and even the ways they can publicize their work. Sanctions, along with other systems for curtailing the actual movement of artworks and their makers from inside Iran, such as strict visa policies, put under the spotlight any claims that cleanly couple globalization and the art market. Sanctions and their impact offer a direct challenge also to any lofty ideals that we've been speaking about these past few days that seeks to separate art from money by showing how the circulation of art is deeply embedded in the circulation of money. So as I said, the art objects themselves may be able to circulate, but the money in which you would need to bring them out can't so freely. What's ironic is that the kind of political rhetoric, the distancing between us and them that centers much of the discussions of sanctions by Western powers trickles down into art writing, curatorial framing, and general interest in the art of Iran. How can we grapple with the lived experience of Iranian art world actors while avoiding the fetishization of the political structures that limit their movement? Anthropologist Patricia Spires a uh, notion of a border fetish perhaps provides a useful way to conceptualize how Iranian art and artists are brought into international arenas due to, due to the specificity, we can say this about the broader Middle East certainly, due to the specificity of the political situation they are working in. But at the customs house, a national origin may have very real material consequences. In this arena, Iranianness is not a question of discoverable ethnic or national affiliation, as might be suggested to a dealer speaking at an art fair to a potential collector. Rather, the ways in which that des such designations mean that artworks may be stopped, taken out of circulation, or delayed on their routes tells an important part of their biography of how they come into being in a certain time and place. Thank you.
Good evening. So, is that okay? Okay. So first, I really want to thank the organizer for inviting me. It is a special moment for me to speak here in a fair, since I represent a museum institution, which is quite apart from the economic art market. Why? Because unlike a center of art, a museum defines itself by acquiring works and constitute a coherent collection that will grow up through the years. So the museum is like a final home for the works. They, are, they will not move again, and they are offered to a wider audience. Today, the collection of the Louvre Abu Dhabi possesses 649 works. These works are thus gone from the market of art. But it doesn't mean our museum is not linked with the global circulation of art, as we will see now. First, we are linked to the market on the global circulation of the art at the time of their acquisition. The, trans the transactions crossed by traders, private individuals, galleries, or house of sale. As the Louvre Abu Dhabi embraces the wool period starting in the antiquity and finishing in the 21st century, and as this narrative is about a story of the world, its collection is particularly diversified. The compass rose on the floor in the Grand Vestibule shows the coast of Abu Dhabi and the name of all the countries from where the works are coming. That means from really everywhere. To find those works, the scientific team of the Louvre Abu Dhabi managed by Soraya Nujaim, travels a lot, all around the world. As chief curator for modern and contemporary art, I visit myself many artist studios in different countries, here in Emirates, but also in Saudi Arabia, Asia, USA, Europa, or Africa. There is so a converging movement of each of those work coming from the whole planet to the museum, their final destination, which is, which is really like a museum world. However, all those work and objects have their own story. They have an origin, they were involved in particular loops of circulation. They have all an intimate story, which is, which is intricate with a big story. All those stories are especially important to us because they are part of the story we want to tell in our narrative. The museum gives a special place to the object borders, which are the reflection of crossed stories. For example, we just acquired a Mamelouk ball or that Albarello. In the process of acquisition, a particular attention is given to the origin and to the traceability of the works. The scientific team makes very deep investigations before proposing an object to the acquisition committee. The origin is verified. Scientific analyses are conducted to avoid forgery or too much restored objects. We work attentively cases with ethical and legal tools. There is, of course, a ju ju juridical frame with the Convention of UNESCO, the Convention UNIDRA, ICOM, Interpol, Red List, and also and the, the, uh, Matthew uh, was very interesting in his presentation uh, two hours ago about the traffic, and we have to be very aware, because we respect the deontology of museum and heritage, see, since we absolutely want to avoid feeding the illicit traffic of artworks, of course. So through its acquisitions, the Louvre Abu Dhabi has, of course, also an impact of the market of art. I was not so surprised to see that year in Abu Dhabi Fair some Jenny Holzer or Faisal Labi work in the stand since they are exhibited in Louvre Abu Dhabi. This is a Jenny Holzer in the Louvre Abu Dhabi. 
Present being in the collection of a museum is often considered by a, to be a consecration for an artist. So the museum influences the market of art by exposing certain artists on open new perspectives which impact their trade valuation. The circulation of works concerns not only the acquisition, but also the loans. Works of the collection can be lent to other museums for an exhibition. The basic game by Carl Gbot was lent to the National Gallery of Art in Washington in 2015. But the Louvre Abu Dhabi welcomes allow many loans, especially from French museums. Indeed, through the intergovernmental agreement, the Louvre Abu Dhabi benefits of the loans of 13 French institutions within 10 years. Most of the loans stay in the museum for one year. Paperwork and photo have to be changed every three months, when very heavy works can stay more than three years, like Ramses. The museum also has local and regional loans from Alain, Jordan, Oman, Rasal Rema, and will continue to increase its reach across the region. It welcomes also loans from Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. Finally, the museum proposes temporary exhibition. The intergovernmental agreement includes four exhibitions per year for 15 years, such as the current exhibition, Japanese Connection. The museum has been exploring also partners within the region as well such as the Roads of Arabia exhibition in collaboration with the Saudi Commission for Tourism and National Heritage. Road of Arabia has been traveling for many years in different countries. That kind of itinerary exhibition is part in another way of the global circulation of art. To conclude, I would say that the circulation of works is always, for any museum, a big challenge, because we have to be sure that no one accident happens to the work during transportation, installation, and exhibitions. The conservation of the work is at the heart of our duties. But as difficult it may be, that circulation helps to make circulate ideas on publics, and to allow the audience to discover other works and cultures. That means that global circulation of art involves also, of course, the public itself. In the Louvre Abu Dhabi, we had one million visitors for the first year, and we hope to welcome as many people next year. 40% of that audience is coming from the UAE, but 60% are tourists coming from all the world. Every day with my team, we see visitors in the gallery coming from all the world. The diversity is unbelievable. They are often trying to find works coming from their own country, and they are always very happy and proud to find an object of their own home displayed in such a universal museum. That participate of the appropriation by the public of that museum and creates a special relationship almost an affective one. All that circulation helps to make bridge over the differences and it is at the core of Louvre Abu Dhabi project, both philosophical and humanist, to succeed in it. Thank you very much. Hello. There we go. Um, I just want to thank everyone, uh, Nada, Salwa, and their team um, for inviting me and uh, bringing me here. Um, I have to warn you, my slides are a little boring. So uh, I know I'm the last speaker, and this is kind of a dangerous thing, but I couldn't I was working on this talk and I just couldn't come up with better ideas for slides. So I'm going to be as entertaining as I can. Um, and we'll see if it works. Um, so perfect. This is where I wanted to start. Um, 
So I've titled my talk, The Age of the Transnational Museum, and I'm gonna try to talk about um, ideas of circulation, not so much in terms of people or artworks, um, but in terms of institutions. Um, we'll see if this works. Museums have traditionally been national or civic institutions dedicated to a particular community. A range of scholars have employed institutional critique to consider the museum as a producer of knowledge, as capturing some of the essential historical conceptions of its time, or as, prom as promoting an ideology specific to the nation or the regime that created it. In the post-structuralist version, museums are discursive institutions that impart a means of knowing the world onto their viewer, whether they are organized around a particular narrative, such as promoting a certain interpretation of history, or whether they embrace more universalist claims, such as the appreciation of works of beauty. Even art museums founded by private individuals for the benefit of the public are conceived to produce social meanings beyond the intentions of their founders. Could Solomon Guggenheim have imagined, for example, that the institution that bears his name would one day become a global brand uh, with branches in New York, Venice, Bilbao, and eventually Abu Dhabi? What I am suggesting will likely not be surprising to anyone in the audience today, namely that museums serve purposes beyond their original intentions. These purposes affect not only individuals who visit them, but the societies in which they have been established. Today, the museum founding phenomenon has become so widespread around the world, it is necessary to ask, what role do art museums play in global political developments? And further, is there a new set of transnational dynamics, social, cultural, and economic, that museums might help us to understand better? My talk today will address these questions to both private museums, like those founded by individuals in the United States and so many other countries today, as well as public institutions still connected to a state and the role of its government in the international order. The question at the base of this panel today is one of circulation. It is clear that art objects have been crossing borders for millennia by this point, but the history of international exhibitions is somewhat shorter. And one development that might point us to an originating moment would be the World's Fairs that began in, 19, or in 1851 with the Crystal Palace exhibition in London. This exhibition was basically a supercharged international trade show devoted to manufacture goods that glorified industrial production among the nations who had developed it. But it was not without what might be called its exotic charms. Products from non-industrialized countries, you can see on the right, many of which would be essential to the industrial development of Europe because they provided raw materials and markets for the European nations. While this first exhibition included sculpture in London, which had become an industrial art by that time, it did not include paintings as fine art, an innovation that the Paris Exposition Universelle introduced in 1855. These depictions of the Second World's Fair in Paris demonstrate the international competition among works of art in the gallery on the left, as well as on the right, the colonial hall featuring exotic flora and objects like the Buddha sculpture in the center that would now be found in a museum of art like the Louvre Abu Dhabi. There are two very different registers here and I present the juxtaposition for two reasons. The first is to remind everyone that there are two distinct understandings of international embodied in these images. On the one hand, there is an international competition among countries whose artists make oil paintings. This competition was quite frankly designed to play to France's strengths and to demonstrate its leadership in the international arena. The international competition is among painters is one which might be called a level playing field with everyone basically producing the same kinds of works, some large of historical import and others small for immediate effect. But nevertheless, every artist was conforming to a clear set of principles mutually understood. In the colonial hall, by contrast, Global exploration and shipping, made possible through industrial technology, has brought to Europe an incredible variety of products displayed to be appreciated as strange vestiges of distant cultures under the thumb of one colonial power or another. 
These objects do not compete for artistic glory or attest to the elevated aesthetic values of the people who made them, but they function to portray strange and distant lands. The Venice Biennale, founded near the end of the 19th century in 19, 1894 and first held in 1895, was the location where an international competition among artists became the main attraction and nations built their own pavilions in the Giardini to showcase their national artistic heroes in what can be described as an Olympics of art. International and competition go hand in hand here, and while artist reputations were formed in Venice, the focus was on national representation. To this day, the State Department of the United States still determines which artists can represent the country at the Venice Biennale, and this is true in other countries as well. However, New dynamics emerged in the 20th century, in which the central pavilion, uh, which you see on the left, housed an, uh, yes, on the left, housed an exhibition curated by a single curator or curatorial team. And thus, the image on the right from the 2015 manifestation, uh, curated by Nigerian-born curator Okwi Onwizor, features works by Glenn Ligon, an American artist, the letters on the front, and Oscar Murillo, a Colombian painter living and working in London. Those are the hanging um, uh, fabric pieces. In this slide, the international dynamic of the biennial mixes actors from different countries and regions, albeit all participated all of these guys are participating in a form of artistic exhibition that might be described as a kind of global norm. In the biennial, artists and curators are brought from around the world and their ideas complement and overlap one another to produce a texture of meaning that ostensibly tells us something important about the state of the world today. Biennials are both institutions and not. The anthropologist Pascal Guillen has called them post-institutions. But everyone seems to agree that museums are institutional in character, even if in the 20th century they are now present everywhere. It was the Guggenheim Museum that can be credited, for better or worse, um, under the directorship of Thomas Krenz, for imagining a new kind of existence for museums that can manifest themself, themselves in multiple sites at once. Granted, the Guggenheim already managed at the time two sites when he took over in New York and Venice where Peggy Guggenheim had lived out many of the days after the passing of her husband. But Krenz inaugurated the franchise model of museums by expanding the Guggenheim, first to Soho in New York and Berlin and later to Bilbao and even Las Vegas. More recently, the Guggenheim proposal on Helsinki, Finland was killed by a democratic revolt and the museum here in Abu Dhabi is on hold. While many of these franchises have already come and gone, only four are currently listed on the Guggenheim website, including Abu Dhabi, what emerges are the marks of a budding multinational nonprofit corporation. The brand is marked by edgy design, first Frank Lloyd Wright, on the left, and later Frank Geary on the right. Canonical modern, the other aspects it has are canonical modern, ab modernist abstract art, and frankly, an exhibition program that could be described as avant-garde, because it is always pushing the boundaries of what modern art museums show, from motorcycles to Brazilian religious sculpture. The, Guggen, the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi promises as much in its Frank Gehry design set upon Sadiat Island, and yet it also represents the first concrete step the Guggenheim has made outside of the U.S. and Europe, and thus it engages new challenges and new opportunities. Since the challenges seem to be outpacing the opportunities at this point, I'm going to move on. But I do want to say that as a brand, it promises top-end art experiences, edgy curating, and life-changing architecture. And this combination is hard to compete with. As with other manufacturers produced by multinational corporations, it is hard for local competitors to have the clout or the resources to rise to their level. If there is a Guggenheim Museum in your town, everyone will go there first. Unless, that is, there happens to be a Louvre around the corner. As far as art museum brands go, the Louvre is pretty much unmatched. 
Dating back to the Napoleonic conquests, it houses many of the fruits of those victories, as well as France's own artistic legacy, and attracts more visitors than any other art museum in the world. Unlike the Guggenheim, it is a national project dedicated to preserving the patrimony of France for the French, but also to show everyone else how incredible the French national art collection is. The French state simply has outperformed any other entity in the world at collecting art, and they set the bar. It is fair to say that leaders around the world, including here in the Emirates, have noticed, and many are interested in emulating their enlightened patronage in the 21st century. The Louvre implicitly, and sometimes explicitly, lends significance to France, a kind of soft power that signifies the glory of France on a global stage. But its mission is preservation and focused on the idea of patrimony, a concept foreign to many residents of the United States and I'm guessing in many other countries as well. Patrimony suggests that a nation is obliged to preserve for future generations the greatest products of its culture. And that, is the, and that it is the state's job to manage this important responsibility. In the centralized French model, patrimony is managed by the Ministre de Culture, representing a considerable outlay from the French national budget to protect and promote the value of the nation's cultural treasures. In this neoliberal era, when privatization and deregulation are the modus operandi of most states, France certainly represents a cultural exception. What is really important and one might say paradoxical, is that France has figured out how the state and its treasury can benefit from the alternative it represents by using state entities to compete in a deregulated market. For example, since the deregulation of utilities in the United Kingdom under Margaret Thatcher, at first uh, they were all bought by Americans. But once the Americans figured out they couldn't make a bunch of money really fast, they sold them. To who? Electricité de la France. So even though the train that goes under the channel pulls into Waterloo Station, the power that charges that train is money paid by the state of the United Kingdom to the state of France. By the same logic, the Louvre, as the premier art museum globally, is well placed to capitalize on its prominent position in the global market for museum brands. And there are material advantages for doing so, of course. In one way, the Louvre has followed the Guggenheim's model by expanding beyond Paris uh, to Atlanta, then Lens, and now Abu Dhabi. Yet the Louvre is not a private museum, but a public one and its premier responsibility to preserve patrimony would seem at first to be challenged by the globalization of its collection. Many a conservator would tell you it is simply not good for the arts to be traveling around the world, and how does it help the citizens of France to have their national treasures on view in Atlanta or Abu Dhabi? There is an argument to be made uh, that it does help the French nation, but that's not the point I'm trying to make today. Instead, I want to ask if the French state, through its cultural arm, represented by the Louvre, might in fact be creating an important innovation for our global era that I would like to call transnational patrimony. Rather than a group of objects that serves the interest of a nation, the collection of the Louvre and other national French museums that are there, that are on loan in uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi, when this collection is distributed across a wider sphere, right, it becomes, in a sense, transnational. When the institution travels, the social meaning of the collection changes by being imbricated in the global network of transport and communication. Of course, museums claim to represent universal values, and the Louvre possesses objects from every corner of the world, but post-colonial countries have long seen through this masquerade, perceiving in universalism an imposition of European values upon the entire universe. In a transnational model, by contrast, the patrimony is expanded beyond the national frame 
and has the opportunity to ignite the imaginations of other citizens who may have no connection to France whatsoever. It is somewhat paternalistic to think of France sharing its patrimony with those countries it might once have counted as potential colonial possessions. And yet, when patrimony becomes transnational, it loses some of its claims to national authority. The transnational, by contrast, signifies a passage beyond one nation and into another. And there is a sense of mutual engagement and value added benefit, not colonial imposition. The slide on the left is interesting in this regard, and I must admit, I put these slides together before I visited the Louvre Abu Dhabi, which I did yesterday. Um, but here we have at the Louvre Abu Dhabi, Emirati visitors and others on a, in, in a display of ancient art of the Near East, as museums like to call it. Um, although now I know it's not just that, there's cultures from all over the world mixed in this gallery, um, including France and the UAE. Um, but as you can tell, most of the objects are not from these two places. Displaced from their home in Paris, these objects come to life in a new way on the Arabian Peninsula. Um, the objects on view are primarily not from here any more than they are from France. So patrimony here means preservation and access, but also appreciation. It is not an accident of history that France owns these objects. Uh, there is money, uh, or, or the UAE for, the mat for that matter, those owned by the Louvre Abu Dhabi. There is money and power um, and a long colonial history in the French case that resulted in this state of affairs. And yet, France is transmitting these objects into another context where their reception will be quite distinct in the way that the objects form a collective experience. Not national glory or universal beauty, but situated knowledge and an opening to shared values that emerge from exposure to long-preserved images of significance and power. Transnational patrimony suggests that each visitor sees and understands, guided by museum didactics, of course, but translated into new languages and suggesting new means of coming to terms with culture. The international domain of the 19th century produced a kind of globalization, of course, leading to international exhibitions such as those discussed earlier. But the neoliberal era of the 21st century has generated more global connections than ever before, effectively represented by Abu Dhabi art itself and this conference that accompanies it. It is true that an art fair is driven by the market, and yet there is something else going on that is not captured by economic analysis, a kind of enthusiasm for cultural products brought together from everywhere, and indeed an interest to gather knowledge producers like myself convened from distant shores to meet here this week. The presence of the Louvre Abu Dhabi anchors this event and is in no doubt an inducement for many to visit. We are the transnational citizens of the 21st century bearing rights to a global culture. Where we stand in relationship to it and what we derive from it may be quite distinct, but we all share a fascination for transcending the limitations of the present by learning from the transnational patrimony that enriches us all. Thank you. And thank you for the great talk. And it was really interesting to hear all these three very different, but also related to the topic, the global circulation of the art. And starting with the Laylee, uh, she explained about like, how the, the global circulation of art can actually happen in the artist level using and then emphasizing more of the institutional barriers and institutional factors that actually affect on an artist to circulate his, his or her art. 
And while the uh, Juliet is kind of emphasized how the museum can be a very the connection factor, where the, all the collection can come to the Louvre Abu Dhabi, and then explaining about like multiple different the national collections that actually can be presented to different audiences here, while John is kind of the bring up to this different level of the global circulation of the museum itself, to explaining the transnational aspect of the museum that how that actually impact on the global circulation of art in at large. So I'll open up the question to the floor and then have some more questions from the audiences. Yes, please. Can you bring the mic? Uh, this question is more orientated, please, to the curator of modern and contemporary uh, art in the Louvre. Actually, yesterday night I was visiting very carefully again this incredible uh, museum. All my admiration for the huge and incredible goals that French government and everyone have been accomplishing with uh, this museum. But every time that I visit the museum, a big interrogation come to me and to many of us, I believe, about what I heard. And it is related actually to the contemporary room who talks me in another level or in a very different way than the rest of the museum. I know that the Museum of Louvre in Paris doesn't have particularly a contemporary, let's say, presence there. But I need to know why in the contemporary exhibition here you are focused just in what I saw yesterday again, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, eh, Emirates, Chinese because I Weiwei, Wei, and uh, another local artist. Where are they? talking about transnational, talking about all the international profile in every single area of the museum, where are the other relevant contemporary artists and why this uh, exhibition is so small? Ah, it's a good question. Um, the museum was first, um, first Emirati states decided to ask an architect, Jean Nouvel, to imagine a museum. So it was first a gesture with an architect. Then they, they were trying to find a team that could help to make the collection. So I think the, uh, when Jean Nouvel drew the museum, with that very tiny room at the end, because it's, yes, it's one of the, of the smallest one. Uh, I think he was thinking about the projection in the future with Guggenheim Abu Dhabi next door. So I think it is why it is true that the, the room dedicated to 21st century, it's, it's quite small, uh, but I hope we will develop uh, contemporary art in, in other space, for example, in our plaza, outside with co commission, and so because I can just agree with you, we should uh, it, it's limited. So we have to try to develop it, and it's such a small uh, room; it's very challenging. So we try to to open it to the world, and you mentioned different continents. But yes, I think we will try to make uh, uh, to find other things maybe in the garden also on something more um, evolving in the time because contemporary art is the artist of tomorrow also so in the future in the next 20 years new works will come and we have to show them somewhere but i think also as it is part of a big project with guggenheim uh, national museum check zayed also uh, things will be also displayed all together at the end. Um, I have a question for John. I mean, I kind of feel weird asking questions when I'm the MC, but that's OK. So John, I'm really intrigued with this notion of transnational pat patrimony. Um, and you talk about it in terms of preservation, appreciation, and in a place like you gave the example of the Louvre specifically. So 
how do we though resolve or how do we um, sort of step progress from a colonial collection to accepting it as transnational pa patrimony, thinking that it's maybe, okay, the Louvre is not necessarily uh, promoting national sort of, you know, pride, but then at the same time, you know, we can't dissociate from the colonial presence. So if you could say a few things about this, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I mean, one thing about this idea uh, of transnational uh, patrimony is that, you know, it's, um, it's really a way of framing. Um, it, you know, as with so many terms, it's it, trying to find um, words that will explain the new kinds of social phenomena we're experiencing in this moment, right? And a lot of what I hear um, when writing about museums or reading about museums um, is often either looking at them as kind of these colonial institutions that must be unmade or un, uh, under, uh, you know, sort of undermined even, um, particularly from certain community activists at this point and, and the kinds of relationships that are developing between, um, you know, antagonistic relationships developing in certain cases. Um, but on the other hand, um, we also think of uh, museums as um, these wonderful cultural uh, institutions that are doing things, they're nonprofits, it's all for the betterment of humankind. But in the end, like, wait, no, there's actually competition here, right? And there's a reason that the art newspaper publishes, like, the top 20 most visited museums every year and the top 20 most visited exhibitions every year. And, and so in that sense, we also have to look at it in terms of um, the political economic dynamics of neoliberalism. And so in, in that sense, the idea of transnational patrimony, I agree at the end it sounds a bit Pollyanna-ish, but I'm trying to account for you know, sort of uh, that which is the core of globalization, um, in other words, that sort of crossing of boundaries, value-added activity, um, and also the kind of imbalance of power that exists in the world, right? Um, but without using um, uh, a more generic and I think, frankly, at this point, old-fashioned idea of universalism, right? Um, and so patrimony is something we always apply to nations. And nations, as we know, are different than states. States are administrative apparatus with particular boundaries, right? Nations are these kinds of imaginary constructions that we cling to. And if we can cling to nations as a construction, isn't it also possible that we can cling to something larger than a nation, right? Um, I don't know many people who would sign up to cling to globalism or globalization as their sort of something to hang their hat on, but I do think that this idea of passing back and forth, as so many of us have done to get to this conference, crossing borders, um, uh, this is something that more and more people can relate to. And I think that this is something that these museums are suggesting to me. Um, if there is no question. Yeah. Um, I'm also really intrigued about um, transnational patrimony, and I think it's incredibly interesting how um, we're talking about um, culture sort of transcending these national borders. But I also wonder um, the direction in which, in which these borders are being trespassed, because um, when um, you were speaking about if there was the Louvre in your town, everybody would be at the Louvre, right? But then doesn't that also sort of limit the way that um, national like galleries may grow and how national art may grow? Because um, institutions that may seem to a certain extent like colonizers, they are also deciding the art that is being displayed in the museums. So it sort of dictates the way in which the art will go to. Right. I mean, in some sense, it's about the organizing concept that um, museums adopt, right? So uh, a national museum um, will adopt, I mean, because it's funded by the national government, 
um, you know, and France's contribution to culture. I mean, we don't even have a ministry of culture in the United States. France contributes 7% of their national budget to culture. I mean, that's just outrageous, right? Um, uh, uh, like, that's why I want to live in France. But the, <laughs> the, I mean, because they value what, what I do. But, but it, what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that on one hand, you've got this national idea of the museum, right? And then there's also civic institutions, right? Which try to promote more local kind of engagement. Um, and this is primarily the way that a lot of institutions in the United States were founded. Um, rich folks getting together and deciding to do something good for the city of New York or the city of Philadelphia or the city of Boston or the city of Chicago. And, um, and you know, giving their treasures and crafting their tax laws <laughs> so that all of this works out for everybody's benefit, but particularly theirs. And, um, you know, it's also going to tell a certain kind of story. I guess what I'm most interested in as a counter-narrative to this brand idea, the franchise, is the, the homemade museum, right? Um, and that's the kind of, like, initiative that I think is really fascinating. Um, sometimes that comes from wealthy people dying and not wanting to give their art to museums, like the Barnes Collection. Um, but in other cases, it can be um, derived from a community initiative. And in that case, an institution, like a museum, doesn't need even to have a collection. It can be a space for engagement and for encounter. Um, and, you know, the problem with that, of course, is that, you know, it doesn't probably have much money to pay anybody. And so therefore, the level of professionalism is going to be different. But, but I think that that should also be part of the landscape of what museums do. And I think that as long as there's people who care enough about it, a, a, a preserving culture or uh, developing places to um, have conversations about culture, then there will continue to be new kinds of museums formed all the time. I don't know exactly if I answered your question, but I hope so. Uh, I have, I have a, let's say, a question or a very generic set of reflection on the topic. Um, the first is, uh, as far as I understood, the Louvre presence here in Dubai is not an independent action of the Louvre Museum, but it is part of a broader relationship that the French government did and en en enacted with, with, with the Abu Dhabi government. So I think we should be careful about imagining that this is a strategy of the Louvre itself. It is more kind of state um, foreign policy. And this is a frame in which we should consider the operation more generally. The second point is, um, what is interesting is that these operations do take years to become real, right? And sometimes I have the impression that what we are looking at is something which, is, which has been thought uh, maybe 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. I don't, I don't remember exactly the, the time. It was more than 10 years ago, right? Uh, but now the situation internationally is completely transformed. So I'm wondering if these operations are still meaningful at global level uh, in terms of, of diffusing this kind of institution or if the international situation now is demanding other kind of operation. And these are a little bit kind of very beautiful relics of a former way of doing this kind of international policies, cultural policies. And the third, I wonder if we have a kind of displacing effect, because we were listening today about the necessity for these countries to have museums that are operating a good job about the archive of the artist, about this kind of consolidation of of the local artistic practices in order to, to, to be able to cope with the international requirement. But these museums are attracting a lot of resources and maybe so there is a crowding out effect 
in relationship with what is needed by the local scene to grow as a creative scene and, and, and the creative engagement. So I, am, I think that we really are in, uh, facing a transformation of the way in which the global, the global culture is, is done. And um, I really think about the opportunity of going on in this direction or maybe changing. I don't know what to think of. <laughs> Thank you, Stefano. That, that raises a lot of interesting points. I'm actually, I'm going to turn one of them over to Juliet because I think that in, in some sense, uh, my own understanding of the relationship between the Louvre and the Louvre Abu Dhabi is certainly not as sophisticated as hers. But, the, um, uh, but I do think that um, we have to be very careful, you know, to your last point, really. Uh, we have to be very careful about um, political rhetoric um, and the way that political rhetoric operates um, in terms of structuring our consciousness and our ability to imagine the world that we exist in. Um, uh, do we think that IKEA is going to go away? Uh, iPhones, um, you know, any H&M? No, it's not going to go away. So globalization is here to stay. There's no question about it. Um, there's a lot of people spouting nationalist rhetoric, and you know, in the end, uh, okay. So the United States may be, you know, sliding towards civil war. You know, that this is my takeaway from the last election. But, but you know, a lot of the nationalist parties that we're talking about, like Alternative for Deutschland, for example, yeah, they're making incredible gains, but they're still like 15% of the population, right? These parties are overreported systematically by a media that is dying for controversy and to feed a, a monster which, you know, is about hyperbole of political representation. And so to, to extract from um, the media's um, take on neo-nationalism neo that globalization is in somehow reductive, um, I think that's overstating. And also, I'm sure that, you know, the national museums aren't going to go away. And so national culture will continue to be fed on a variety of levels. I remember that the, the ultranationalists are ultranationalists, right? And in places like Poland, maybe it's a bit confusing when the government decides to go march with them. But, but for the most part, we have to really remember that, that this is a, a fringe, right? And that this is a... a a group that we should probably do well not to give too much credence to. Because in a sense, while they're virile in their proclamations and they're really good at using social media, um, they don't represent the majority um, and certainly not the sort of ideological assumptions that undergird our global uh, you know, geopolitical structure. I believe the Juliet also have some comments. It's, it's quite uh, touchy, and um, but you you made a point. It's uh, the Louvre, Abu Dhabi. It's an Emirati museum, so it's a museum uh, that the country of Emirates wanted, and it is their own project. So the link with the Louvre, Paris, is also. Uh, not so easy. Louvre has also another museum in Lens, in the north of France. And it is very different because the scientific team of the Louvre Paris is also scientific responsible for Louvre Lens. Here in Abu Dhabi, uh, half of the, of the team is Emirati, and the other half is very mixed. And of course, like me, many people are French because of that partnership and uh, that link uh, we have with a collection of French museums. But really, the scientific, the content, also the strategy is really Emirati. And also for the commission of uh, acquisition, uh, it's half and half French and half Emirati, and Emirati they have the veto. So it's, I think it's very important what you say because we have to think. Uh, that museum have to have some roots in that country. It is an Emirati museum. And so the evolution also on when the brand Louvre, the name, it's only for 30 years. We will see after 
and uh, let's discuss in uh, 30 years also for the to look the evolution and um, but your your question is complex so i i don't know if i answer already but uh, it's very interesting can i ask a question for lily <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry go ahead <laughs> well I'll go ahead the audience, the audience we'll have to i've talked about. enough <laughs> I'm interested in um, the panel's view on ownership of art by museums and the importance of deaccessioning de art to, to sort of facilitate the circulation of art and to make sure that the collection is fresh and current. And I just wondered what your views are because the, the topic of deaccessioning by museums is so uh, touchy and I don't, for me, I don't get it. I mean. And, and, and I wondered what your views are on that. Be interested. Deaccession. Deaccession. So, you know, s selling art that is owned by Sorry, museums so you can acquire more. Uh, selling off the collection. Ah, okay. About um, yeah, inability of the collection. Okay. Uh, it's a very interesting point. Um, you know, in France, we have that law of inalienability. In France, museum, public, public museum, public collection, only can buy and own things, and they never will be able to uh, sell again a collection because it's inalienable. It's, it's in the law. In America, it's different. They don't have the same law. So. Um, in the case of Louvre Abu Dhabi, we are creating a collection, and of course we are thinking to a coherent, co very coherent collection. But because of that story, uh, now we have a lot of loans, and in 10 years we hope the collection will be uh, strong enough to, to avoid loans uh, like that. But I think it, it will be, it's not previous to, to send the collection. They are intended to be part of the collection. They have an inventory number, of course. And so, uh, it's, yeah, it's the collection are not to be sold in the future. It is, uh, we are not thinking of that when buying and making, creating that collection. So yes, Lely, then. Please, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the sanctions represent a kind of extreme example. Um, but I wonder about um, the, the history of Iranian contemporary art, um, and particularly in the transition from um, the Pahlavi dynasty to the Islamic Republic, um, and how that affected um, that kind of geopolitical transition, did that really shift the position of Iranian contemporary artists in the world? I, I guess there's two parts to that, one of which is, of course, it must have created artistic refugees, right? Um, but then the other part is, did the, you know, did the regime's, um, like, political perspective limit the artists who stayed in Iran's ability to participate in the global arena? Um, well, sure, the sanctions is an extreme example, but the there have been sanctions against Iran since 1979. So it's not as if they're new, just perhaps different forms of them. So it's not as if that hasn't been present. Um, certainly there's one kind of idea that after the revolution there was just no art making, right? and that everyone either fled or just there was absolutely no kind of room for expression. Perhaps there wasn't that much publicly, but there certainly was in kind of workshops, artists that were still around would have people privately working. Um, so there was still art making being made. But as far as the political kind of situation, so in, in the early 2000s when Khatami was the president who began this kind of dialogue of civilization, dialogue of nations, there was this much more outward focus and people were beginning to go to Iran more as in some of people that had been exiled perhaps. Uh, the museum itself began uh, lending works out, bringing works in. So there's quite a few examples working the first exhibition of contemporary Iranian art outside of Iran was in 2001 at the Barbican, and that involved the collaboration of British institutions with Iranian institutions. 
which really doesn't happen very much and hasn't happened all that much since then, and certainly not now. So there was testing the Asia Society in 2014, did an exhibition of Iranian modernism. What's interesting there is, again, thinking about the pre the pre-revolution relationship is that the Gray Gallery at NYU has one of the biggest collections of Iranian modernism outside of Iran. And the museum in Tehran has one of the biggest collections of American modernism, right? They don't. <laughs> but when Asia Society did their exhibition in 2014, they borrowed just one work from inside Iran to test those relationships and to test what could and couldn't move. Uh, in part because of sanctions and just in part because of this lack of any kind of institutional dialogue. Um, so yes, that has changed. Then after Khatami uh, Ahmadi Najad came in, the foreign rhetoric became much more fierce, right? It's Bush makes his access of evil speech and things kind of really quietened down. But what happened during the Khatami era of the early 2000s is there's a lot of production, there's a lot of interest, there's institutional support, but now suddenly that's all kind of quiet. Right? And so then the market kind of can move in on some level to, to offer that support that, that is so hard for artists inside Iran to get. And I think then also you begin to have more circulation between diaspora and home of artists. Is there any question? Okay. Thank you for your talk. Thank you everyone for being here. Just a quick reminder that tomorrow is our third and last day. We will start at three o'clock and we have a set of inspirational speakers that will be um, delivered, by, in, in, inspirational speeches that will be delivered by Khulud al Atiyat and then uh, followed by Till Felrath and Sam Bardwell. But also there will be the screening, the debut of that film here in the region of The Price of Everything. So don't miss it, it will be a great film. Thank you very much.